Thank you for joining us. I'm David Barker from the National Museum of the United States Navy. I'm welcoming Dr. Sean Woodford from the History and Heritage Command and Archives Division, giving an overview of the Naval Act of 1938. Thank you, Doctor. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Woodford, and I'm the Supervisory Historian of NHHC's OPNAV Support Section. I'm here today to talk to you about the Navy's shipbuilding program in the years leading up to World War II. While many think that the effort to build the wartime two ocean fleet began in 1940, in fact, it actually started seven years earlier, in 1933. That vital head start provided the shipbuilding infrastructure and trained workers necessary to ramp up the wartime production. It also provided the Navy battle fleet that fought the crucial first years of the war. Part 1, the Navy in 1933. Secretaries of the Navy and Chiefs of Naval Operations struggled through the 1920s and early 1930s to align Navy force planning with presidential and congressional policy. This stemmed from a decade of commitment to international naval arms control and economy-minded U.S. governments. Presidents Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover all pursued negotiation and treaties as a means of curbing military arms races, widely thought to have helped start the First World War. Congresses through the 1920s were also committed to lower taxation and fiscal stringency and sought to restrain military spending in general. The parties to the 1922 Washington and 1930 London treaties, the United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, agreed to cap the numerical size, aggregate tonnage, individual vessel tonnage, and armament of their navies. In 1930, a holiday on new battleship construction was extended through 1936. Battleships were limited to 35,000 tons and guns no longer larger than 16 inches. Other combatants were also limited in size and armament. In exchange for connect Consenting to an unequal capital ship and tonnage limit ratio with the United States and Great Britain, Japan obtained a ban on building, fortifying, or improving new naval bases in the Pacific Ocean. While many in the U.S. Navy opposed the treaty, treaty limitations, the political reluctance to build the fleet up to the numbers allowed posed the real constraint. Navy leaders subscribed to the national policy articulated in 1915 of building a fleet, quote, second to none at least equal in size to the British Royal Navy. Many believe the treaties guaranteed this parity and the Navy's shipbuilding recommendations through the 1920s were based on building a full treaty fleet. However, between 1922 and 1932, the Navy laid down and received appropriations for, for only one aircraft carrier, 16 cruisers, 11 destroyers, and six submarines. President Hoover's dedication to military disarmament and the onset of the Great Depression in 1929 led to further cuts to the Navy's budget and reduced shipbuilding. Just days after the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in September 1931, he canceled all Navy construction plans for fiscal year 1933. Carl Vinson, chair of the House Naval Affairs Committee, proposed legislation in January 1932 for a 10 year ship construction program to replace overage vessels and bring the fleet up to treaty limits. Faced with a deepening global economic depression, Hoover opposed additional naval spending, so the proposed proposal failed to advance out of committee. CNO Admiral William Pratt's 1932 annual estimate of the situation warned Navy Secretary Charles Adams that the Navy's basic war plan could not be executed, quote, due to failure to initiate and carry on a well-balanced program of new construction. On 30 June 1932, the United States Navy had 148 combat ships in commission, crewed at 85% of their peacetime complements, and operated 45 more with further reduced crews or at dockside undergoing modernization. The battle fleet totaled just under 1 million aggregate tons. To alleviate personnel and operating fund shortfalls, 19 destroyers and 11 submarines have been placed in reserve commission with rotating crews to maintain them at a satisfactory rate of readiness. The Navy already found itself inferior in many respects to both the British and the Japanese navies. If Congress authorized no further shipbuilding, it would fall short of permitted treaty caps by tens of thousands of tons in aircraft carriers and cruisers and well over 100,000 tons in destroyers by 1935. In his at 1930 annual report, Navy Secretary Adams reported, quote, that our present building program does not provide for a, a treaty navy, 
B, replacement of overage vessels. C, rectifying our already seriously impaired position relative to other signatories to the naval treaties, nor for preventing further undermining of that position. The slow pace of shipbuilding had larger ramifications. An American construction boom between 1914 and 1921 yielded a large number of new naval and merchant ships, followed by a virtual halt through the next decade as a result of overproduction and the naval treaties. Adams warned, quote, the private shipbuilding industry in the United States is in serious condition due to the almost complete lack of work in either commercial or government. Permanent injury to this vital industry would mean serious impairment to the national defense and to the maritime and general economic welfare of the country. Congress ruled in 1929 that half of all new naval construction had to be done in Navy shipyards and allocated money for facility improvements. Private owners complained bitterly and the big three firms Newport News, New York Ship, and Bethlehem Four River resorted to a rigged bidding cartel to sustain profitability. The other three remaining private builders, Bath Iron Works, Federal Shipping and Dry Dock Company, and Electric Boat, survived off of cruiser construction and a slight revival in demand for passenger liners and cargo ships, stimulated by a 1928 Maritime Act subsidy to the industry before the Great Depression hit. The Navy maintained eight public yards but only six built ships in this period. Portsmouth, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Norfolk, and Puget Sound. Mare Island focused on repairs, and Charleston effectively shut down. The treaty system significantly influenced Navy strategic thinking. Japan succeeded Germany as the primary naval threat after 1919, and the Navy shifted its battle force to the U.S. West Coast. Navy leaders remained committed to Alfred Thayer Mahan's concept of decisive battle between capital ships to determine sea control. But as historian John Kuhn argued, geography and the treaty ban on new bases and fortification posed a strategic and operational problem. How to wage a naval campaign in the Pacific without forward bases? The Army and Navy Joint Board, comprising the service chiefs and their senior war planners, sought to develop a solution for joint war plan Orange. Navy planners conceived a three-stage war. Conflict would begin with Japan attacking U.S. bases in the Philippines and Guam and seizing key resource areas in the Western Pacific. In the second phase, the prevailing operational concept called for the U.S. fleet to concentrate in its Eastern Pacific bastion and steam directly to relieve the Philippines, a gambit known as the through ticket. Navy strategy, strategists expected the decisive battle with the Imperial Navy to occur after this stage, ending in victory. The final phase called for an air and sea blockade of Japan to force capitulation. By the early 1930s, however, Navy planners conceded the through ticket to be impractical due to Japanese control of the Central Pacific Islands. Army planners had termed it, quote, literally an act of madness. The Navy staff focused instead on options for seizing interim bases in the Central Pacific, a route dubbed the Royal Road and seeking attritional naval combat before moving on toward the Philippines or Japan and seeking a decisive battle. The Army proved amenable to the Royal Road approach and approved plans that committed scarce ground forces and Army Air Corps aircraft to enable it. While the service planners tacitly discarded options for the relief of the Philippines, the Joint Board itself would not accept the political impossibility of abandoning their defense. War Plan Orange defined Navy force planning priorities. Faced with campaigning over great distances, long-range gun battles, amphibious landings, and the growing effectiveness of air power, Navy leaders advocated for a battle fleet balanced between its mainstay battleship battle line and key complementary vessel types, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, submarines, and aviation. The General Board prioritized modernization for the ten oldest battleships for greater range and speed, improved torpedo, mine, and air defenses, and increased gunnery range. It recommended cruiser designs that traded armor for range, speed, and powerful 8-inch guns, ideal for scouting. When these were limited by treaty, the board advocated large light cruisers mounting 12 to 15 rapid-firing 6-inch guns, potentially capable of outshooting existing rivals. It sought larger ocean-going submarines capable of keeping pace with and attacking battleships. The Navy also looked at ways to leverage air power to apply sea power in the Pacific. It experimented with carrier avi aviation support for the battle line, but also in independent task forces. 
To entice Congress to fund Ranger, the General Board had trimmed its tonnage, and CNO Pratt built it as a replacement for Langley, the Navy's first carrier. With Congress reluctant to buy aircraft carriers, the General Board investigated designs for hybrid cruisers with auxiliary flight decks intended to increase the number of aircraft at sea while diluting the risk of losing a carrier in battle. Battleships and cruisers likewise were equipped with multiple aircraft for spotting and scouting. Navy leaders lobbied unsuccessfully for auxiliaries for a fleet train necessary to support long-range operations in the vast Pacific. Part 2, the Roosevelt Renaissance, 1933-1938. The Navy's circumstances changed with the election of New York Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt as president in November 1932. Roosevelt had been a proponent of naval expansion while serving as assistant Navy secretary during World War I. Widely expected to support new ship construction, the shipbuilding industry backed his campaign. Roosevelt selected 70-year-old Claude Swanson as his Navy secretary, while telling others, quote, I am my own secretary of the Navy. The new president world worried privately that the Navy had become inferior to the Japanese fleet, but he publicly supported arms control and avoided any policy challenging the Pacific geopolitical status quo. In March 1933, CNO Pratt recommended to Swanson an eight-year shipbuilding program to build the fleet to treaty strength, acquire aircraft for it, and add needed non-treaty auxiliaries. Navy Bureau of Construction Repair Chief Rear Admiral Emory Land provided supporting construction estimates. When the administration proved unexpectedly unresponsive, Pratt and Land approached Vincent about reviving a proposal rejected by Hoover to fund Navy ship construction as an economic stimulus measure. The initiative attracted bipartisan congressional interest, and Vincent suggested to Roosevelt that it be included in pending New Deal public works relief legislation. Navy staff helped Vincent and Senator Park Trammell, the Senate Naval Affairs Committee chair, craft appropriate language. On 16 June, Roosevelt signed an executive order allocating up to $238 million to the Navy for naval shipbuilding and authorizing, quote, the construction of certain vessels, the construction whereof conforms to the London Naval Treaty. Congress passed the National Industrial Recovery Act the next day, appropriating the funding and adding $30 million more for Navy Yard improvements. Roosevelt publicly emphasized the legislation as one-time unemployment assistance, while telling Swanson, quote, Claude, we got away with murder. By the end of 1933, the Navy had contracted for two Yorktown-class aircraft carriers, four Brooklyn-class light cruisers, 20 destroyers, four submarines, and four sloops. Navy yards were allocated half of this new construction, but the private Big Three firms received the balance of the rest, including the carriers and design responsibility for the new cruisers. Contracts for the smaller vessels were awarded to the other yards, and a second round of Naira funding took place in 1934, providing crucial business to sustain the shipbuilders. Vincent and Admiral William Stanley, Pratt's successor as CNO, drafted legislation in autumn 1933 formalizing a program of new construction and replacement of overage vessels as permitted by treaty. Congress passed the Vincent Trammell Act in March 1934, which set, quote, the composition of the United States Navy at the limit prescribed by the Washington and London treaties. It formally authorized, authorized the carrier WASP as a replacement for Langley, 65 destroyers and 30 submarines to replace overage vessels. Together with the National Industrial Recovery Act approved the previous year, this act defined a Navy shipbuilding program through 1942 for 94 ships, including new battleships after 1936. As a check on private shipbuilders, the act mandated that the first and every other ship in each class, except carriers, be constructed in Navy shipyards to establish a baseline for cost and characteristics. Commercial shipyards were also limited to no more than a 10% profit on building contracts. It also authorized the President to procure naval aircraft commensurate with a treaty navy, of which no less than 10% of which were to be built in government facilities. In approving the bill, Roosevelt made it clear publicly that the new construction had been authorized, but not yet approved for, or not yet appropriated for. That would be up to future Congresses. He also reiterated his commitment to existing treaties and arms control. CNO Stanley pressed the President and Congress to rebuild the U.S.'s aging and deteriorating merchant fleet, which would also provide essential auxiliary vessels for the Navy in the event of war. <clears throat> the Merchant Marine Act, passed by Congress in June 1936, established the Maritime Commission to issue contracts to builders 
and lease or sell government-built vessels to private interests. It also subsidized private shipbuilders and the maritime industry to build and operate ships with dual civilian military characteristics. The Maritime Commission worked closely with the Navy to ensure that the new merchant ships met necessary requirements. Between 1936 and 1939, the Commission contracted for 141 ships, providing more work for shipbuilders. The expiration of the treaty holiday at the end of 1936 heralded the first U.S. battleship construction since 1921. Congress authorized two in Navy's fiscal 1937 building program as overage replacements if the President certified other treaty signatories were building new battleships as well. Roosevelt waited until after the 1930 election to do so, and Swanson did not approve the 16-inch gun armament until July 1937 after the keel of the first ship had been laid. Two more treaty battleships were part of the Navy's fiscal year 1938 building plan. Congress appropriated funds for two in April 1938 and then for two more in a June supplemental in response to the deteriorating international system. Part 4, the end of the treaty system. Passage of the Vincent Trammell Act in 1934 presaged the end of the treaty system. Shortly thereafter, Japan announced that it would withdraw from the Washington Agreement when it expired at the end of 1935. At the instigation of the hardline faction in the Imperial Navy, the Japanese walked out of new arms control talks in London in 1936 after the U.S. and Great Britain declined to agree to numerical parity. The United States, Britain, and France agreed among themselves to continually continue limiting new vessels. Escalator clauses allowed the signatories to build 45,000 ton battleships with 16 inch guns if any original party to the 1922 Washington Treaty breached the limits first. In December 1936, Japan joined the anti comintern Pact and aligned itself with Nazi Germany and Italy. The Imperial Japanese Army invaded China in July 1937 and precipitated a diplomatic crisis with the U.S. by bombing the Navy gunboat Pan A on the Yangtze River in December. The darkening international situation prompted changes in strategic planning. Army, Navy, and Marine Corps planners continued to work on joint orange plans for an offensive against Japan, but by 1935 stopped discussing in detail possible operations beyond the capture of forward bases in the Marshall or Caroline Islands. Their detailed work on amphibious doctrine, naval interdiction, the use of land and sea-based air power, selection of amphibious landing targets, bypassing fortified islands, and advanced naval bases proved invaluable for future wartime planning. Disturbed by German rearmament, however, the Army turned strongly against Plan Orange in late 1937 and called for a defensive posture in the Pacific. In November 1937, the Joint Board deemed Orange, quote, unsound in general and, quote, wholly inapplicable. CNO Admiral William Leahy notified Roosevelt that the Navy nevertheless continued to advocate the focus on Japan and a maximum effort in the Pacific in the event of war. In late 1937, Roosevelt turned to Leahy, a personal acquaintance, acquaintance from his stint as Assistant Navy Secretary, to develop a naval response to the international situation. They agreed the Navy needed to expand beyond treaty limits and to preserve the existing balance composition of the fleet while pursuing larger, faster, and better armed ship-type designs. Concurring on seeking more battleships, Leahy persuaded Roosevelt to arm them with 16-inch guns. Roosevelt wanted additional aircraft carriers as well, but as a member of the Battleship Gun Club, Leahy convinced him that the U.S. already had the world's best carrier fleet. In a meeting with Vincent and Assistant Navy Secretary Charles Edison in January 1938, Roosevelt proposed a 20% increase in naval construction. Leahy worked with Vincent to hammer out the details, and the President sent Congress a special message amplifying the request. Vincent and Leahy led the legislative effort, coordinating testimony and lobbying resistant Congress members. Leahy testified emphatically for a Navy, quote, able to impose a blockade and at the same time not allow another power to control the movement of American goods and supplies. The authorization, known as the Second Vincent Trammell Act, passed in May 1938. It provided for three Iowa-class battleships, two aircraft carriers, nine light cruisers, 23 destroyers, nine submarines, and 20 auxiliaries, and six smaller vessels. The 1934 and 1938 Congressional authorizations enabled the Navy to formulate a 10-year shipbuilding program for 
constructing 14 battleships, 5 carriers, 27 cruisers, 78 destroyers, and 49 submarines by 1948. By September 1939, the Navy had 89 ships under construction. Roosevelt monitored progress closely and sent personal messages urging greater efforts to both the Navy and private shipyards. With a scale of new construction proved to be a boon for many private shipbuilders, others found the profit caps and the investment costs to upgrade their yards for naval work less enticing than contracting for the reviving civilian shipping market. When they attempted to recoup some of these capital ship investment expenses, the Treasury Department objected. Builders who complained when new battleships were awarded to the Navy Yards in 1937 had no objection when the first Iowas were also allocated to government facilities in 1939. Future increases in shipbuilding would require finding ways to increase construction capability. Part 5. The Genesis of the Two Ocean Navy The Navy began considering requirements for global war following the European crisis over Czechoslovakia in 1938. In November of that year, the Joint Board reviewed American strategy and options for defending the Western Hemisphere against simultaneous aggression by Germany and Italy in the Atlantic and Japan in the Pacific. Potential allies were assumed to be neutral or defeated. A supporting study by the Navy General Board in December examined requirements for offensive operations against the combined naval forces of these adversaries. This offered the first tangible estimate for a true ocean navy, a true two ocean navy. It calculated the number of battleships needed to maintain numerical parity against Japan in the Pacific, including amphibious and detached operations, while protecting deploying Army expeditionary forces in the Atlantic and denying naval support, support to Axis operations in South America. That translated into 40 battleships with a balanced supporting fleet of 18 aircraft carriers, 108 cruisers, 399 destroyers, and an appropriate number of auxiliaries. The Joint Board adopted these figures in April 1939 and recommended fresh strategic planning. In June 1939, it began work on the Rainbow series of Joint War Plans. After war broke out in Europe in September 1939, Vincent and the, the new CNO, Admiral Harold Stark, discussed another shipbuilding increase. Stark and OPNAV wanted a two-ocean fleet expansion, but Vincent settled on a 25% boost as politically feasible. Vincent's proposal encountered skeptical opponents asking why the Navy needed another authorization despite not yet having asked for money for the remaining tonnage authorized in 1934-1938. Stark's congressional testimony warned of a dark scenario where the Navy faced off alone against the German, Japanese, and Italian fleets augmented by the captured British and French navies. House legislators whittled the bill down to a two-year, 11% increase, which languished through the spring of 1940 due to personal acrimony between Vincent and Senate Naval Affairs Committee Chair David Walsh. After Navy Department legislative staff brokered a truce, Congress finally passed the bill on 14 June 1940 and permitted Roosevelt to buy or build up to 4,500 naval aircraft. The bill also provided funding for improving the Navy yards. A Congressional Supplemental Appropriation on 26 June funded three Essex-class carriers, three Baltimore-class heavy cruisers, and two Cleveland-class light cruisers, the first 30 Fletcher-class destroyers and 22 submarines. The collapse of France in June 1940 and the prospect of British defeat galvanized Congress. Vincent approached Roosevelt on 17 June, three days after the passage of the 11% expansion, to seek support for another authorization. Facing re-election in November, the President did not think the timing was right. That afternoon, Vincent submitted draft legislation in the House. Stark requested an additional 399,000 tons of new construction in a hearing, which by evening, Vincent had pushed up to 1.25 million tons, a 70% increase over the current program. The measure passed Vincent's committee unanimously on 18 June, and the full House, on a voice vote, on 22 June. Walsh pushed the Senate version through unanimously as well, and Roosevelt signed the Two Ocean Navy Act on 19 July. It authorized new battleships, carriers, cruisers, destroyers, patrol, and escort craft, and funds for Navy and private shipyard expansion and improvements. The bill approved for the President to acquire up to 15,000 naval aircraft and 100,000 tons of auxiliaries. Congress then passed a second supplemental appropriation in September that financed two more Iowas and five Montana-class battleships, 
Seven more Essexes, 33 Baltimores and Clevelands, 155 destroyers, 43 submarines, and 14 auxiliaries. By 9 September, the Navy had let contracts for 199 vessels, many using authority granted by the Act to use no-bid agreements. Congress also rescinded the Vincent Trammell Act limit on profits. American shipyards were building 52 combatants and 62 other types on 1 June 1940. This rose to 368 combatants and 338 other vessels by February 1941. In July 1940, the Navy had a total of 29 shipyards building new construction and 19 working on conversions and repairs. By December 1941, this expanded to 156 and 76 respectively. American shipbuilding capacity continued to expand through 1943. The ships authorized by the Two Ocean Navy Act of 1940 began joining the fleet at the end of 1943. By August 1945, the Navy had 1,166 combatant ships and 5,600 auxiliaries, patrol craft, and landing craft. None of this would have been possible without the partnership between President Roosevelt, Congress, and the Navy leadership that started in 1933. Their steady buildup of new construction and shipbuilding capacity provided a crucial foundation for the two-ocean Navy that prevailed in World War II. Thank you.